Today, we're gonna talk about rocks. They're old and they're everywhere, but have you ever considered where exactly they came from? Or how can they be destroyed? Maybe you've considered that in millions of years, erosion could wear down all of the rocks on the planet and turn the entire planet into a perfect sphere covered entirely by water. If you ever wondered questions like these, you'll have to watch the whole video. So today, we're gonna take a journey through time. You will visit planet Earth during its formation, you will see volcanoes, you will see the action of ice and water, and you will see the different types of rocks and how they're formed. So today, together, we are going to understand the rock cycle. So get ready, activate your neurons, and tighten your seatbelt, because we're about to take a journey down a really rocky road. This is where we live. This is Earth's crust. The crust is made up of many rigid sections of rock. Simple enough, right? But in reality, it's quite a bit more complex than that. We can find areas made purely of rock, while other areas are covered by sediments like sand. And when you look closer, many rocks don't even seem that similar. Some of them, like sandstone, look as though they were made of small grains of sand. But other rocks, like granite, have very different crystalline structure. What is even more intriguing is that on a larger scale, some rocks are organized in large, flat, parallel layers. And even stranger, in some cases, these layers are folded. How can a solid rock fold? Since antiquity, many naturalists wondered how rocks are created. But since the process is so slow, it's basically impossible to see with the naked eye, and the answer wasn't easy for them to find. In the late 18th century, a scientist named Abraham Gottlob Werner proposed a theory called Neptunism in honor of the Roman god of the sea. His hypothesis was that the primitive earth was made primarily of water, but this primitive water held substances that settled down through sedimentation, forming the planet's solid sphere. Of these layers, granite was the heaviest and the most durable, so it deposited first, forming a solid floor. Other newer layers of sediments deposited on top of it, including the abundant fossils of living animals. So, according to this theory, this is how the vast majority of the planet would have appeared. Volcanic activity only had a marginal influence by altering the continent slightly and introducing additional sediments and volcanic rocks. Subsequent minor floods contributed further to the layers, ultimately forming the majority of rocks as a result of particles precipitating from the water. Well, to a person from his time, this theory sounds good, but actually, it was impossible. Werner missed an important consideration because he didn't try to calculate whether the total amount of water on our planet could even hold such a huge quantity of dissolved particles to form the Earth. Even though the oceans appear gigantic, taking up over 70% of the Earth's surface, the quantity of water is actually not really that much. As you can see in this graph, this is the planet Earth, and this is the total amount of water covering it. So, as you can guess, this tiny quantity of water cannot hold the particles necessary to create such a huge planet. In addition, today we know that the quantity of water on Earth is always the same. This is a part of the water cycle. Our planet is neither receiving nor losing any water from any other sources. So water is in constant movement around the Earth, but the quantity of it always remains the same. So, these floods proposed by Werner were basically impossible. Needless to say, this theory did not convince everyone. Finally, it was James Hutton who proposed an alternative theory called Plutonism, in honor of the Roman god of the underworld. Hutton's hypothesis was that the main cause of the rock formation was actually heat provided by the Earth's interior. He suggested that the origin of all rocks was the magma located in the interior of the planet. At this time in the 18th century, 
Scientists had not discovered that the Earth was a gigantic ball of molten material covered by a thin layer of solid rock yet. So this theory was also kind of controversial. Hutton proposed that the islands and continents had emerged, thanks to volcanic activity, from the bottom of the ocean floor. So all the rocks covering the planet had its origin in this primal magma of sorts. Subsequently, rocks would be eroded, turned into sediments, transported and deposited, where the Earth's heat could transform the sediments into new, different rocks. And well, Hutton was really close to the right answer. Certainly, magma was the primal matter that formed all of these rocks, but since he didn't know Earth's structure and about plate tectonics yet, he couldn't really explain how rocks emerged aside from a bit of volcanism here and there. So, now, to fully understand the rock cycle, you are going to travel back to the time when Earth was formed. About 4.6 billion years ago, in our region of the Milky Way, a nebula, which is a large cloud of dust and gas floating in space, collapsed upon itself due to its enormous mass. The materials concentrated, and due to the force of gravity, the heaviest one stayed at the center, beginning to create the sun. The great mass of that nascent sun caused a protoplanetary disk, flattened and rotating around the sun. And then the planets began to form. The theory of planetesimals is the model that best explains how this could have happened. The force of gravity caused the dust and gas floating around the sun to begin to clump together. The bigger the groupings became larger and larger the more mass that they had, attracting more dust, more gas, and more rocks, creating a dynamic in which what were initially just many small particles ended up becoming protoplanets and subsequently planets on their own. For hundreds of millions of years, planets like Earth were attracting the enormous amount of meteoroids that still orbited around the sun, and there were so many impacts that turned the planet into a red-hot hell. This is how it is explained that the interior of the Earth is so hot. The interior of the Earth has a lot of molten iron, but also has many radioactive materials. Finally, we have to consider that the Earth was a molten ball in its origins. When the meteorites stopped impacting, the outer layer gradually cooled, which caused the crust to eventually become a solid and cold layer. But as everything cools from outside to inside, there is still a huge residual heat from when the Earth was formed which, combined with extremely high pressure and radioactivity of the core, causes the temperature at the center of the Earth to exceed 6,000 degrees Celsius. The base of the rock cycle is magma, the molten material that is in the Earth's interior. When magma reaches the surface, it cools down, producing igneous rocks. Igneous rocks are divided into two main groups. If they cool down under the surface, they will cool more slowly and be exposed to higher pressures, leading to bigger crystals, creating what we call plutonic rocks, such as granite. On the other hand, if they make it to the surface, like in a volcanic explosion, they will cool down much more rapidly and won't have time to develop these large crystals. We call this other type of rock volcanic rocks, such as pumice. But, what happens when these rocks are exposed on their surface? The agents of erosion start attacking them. Rain, ice, or even living organisms. They attack and break down these rocks, fragmenting them into smaller and smaller particles. These small particles are called sediments. Sediments are carried downwards by wind or water in a process called transportation until they eventually get deposited in some kind of low point called a depression. And speaking of depressions, that's exactly where I am when I have a giant pile of geology exams to grade. These are another kind of depressions. Basically, they're low points where gravity will bring all of these sediments. These depressions can be valleys or plains, but in general, sooner or later, 
the sediments make their way out to the ocean. And here's where things get really interesting. Near these coastal areas, large amounts of sediments tend to accumulate due to rivers or other sources depositing them there. The weight of the sediments and the pressure of the weight of the ocean water above them compress and compact them, forming layers. When the sediments are under an immense pressure and some magma infiltration raises the temperature nearby, they start experiencing some changes. Under extremely high pressure and temperatures nearing 200 degrees Celsius, the rocks undergo the process of diagenesis. The particles compact, cement together, or recrystallize, transforming into sedimentary rocks. The name, obviously, means that they are made up of sediments. Bruh. For example, gravel turns into conglomerate, sand turns into sandstone, and limes turn into, you guessed it, likes. Okay, sorry, that was bad. I'm kidding. But if you are enjoying this video, please don't forget, click like and subscribe to the channel. Something very simple like this goes a very long way to help the channel. So thank you so much if you do that. Actually, limes turn into limestones. These rocks, buried under a deep layer of sediments, can stay there for millions of years. But if two tectonic plates collide together, they can be pushed back up to the surface. Once they're on the surface, they will be once again exposed to the agents of erosion, so they can be eroded and turn into sediments once again. However, sometimes different things can happen. If the sedimentary rocks remain buried and the temperature exceeds 200 degrees Celsius, it starts a process called metamorphism, which in turn produces metamorphic rocks. Metamorphism comes from two Greek terms, meta, that means change, and morph, that means shape. So these rocks change their properties and turn into new rocks. Just like the morphing from the 90s. So these new rocks are more compact and crystallized than ordinary sedimentary rocks. For example, sedimentary sandstone transforms into metamorphic quartzite, limestone turns into marble, and conglomerates transform into metaconglomerates. The last one is fascinating because you can see how in these metaconglomerates, the gravels get completely flattened due to this pressure. Igneous rocks too can become metamorphic rocks if they're subjected to sufficient temperature and pressure changes. But what would happen if tectonic plates brought these metamorphic rocks back to the surface as well? Well, as always, they will once again be exposed to the agents of erosion. They'll be broken down and turned into sediments. But this cycle also has alternative paths. For example, any type of rock, igneous, sedimentary, or metamorphic, can be dragged back down to the Earth's interior through subduction. The enormous temperatures will melt the rock, transforming it back into magma, and who knows, perhaps it will be brought back to the surface once again, millions of years later, turning back into plutonic or volcanic rocks. So, as you can see, the rock cycle repeats endlessly. It is truly an endless cycle that has been occurring for billions and billions of years here on Earth. But could the rock cycle come to a stop? It seems unlikely that it ever would, but surprisingly, the answer is actually yes. The mechanism of the rock cycle relies on three main factors. First, the Earth's internal energy, which provides heat and causes rocks to melt and ascend. Second, the energy from the sun, which drives atmospheric events like rain or snow that drive erosion. And lastly, we have the force of gravity, which causes materials in elevated areas to fall towards these lower areas. 
looking at these three, the force of gravity will never go away because it's a physical law of the universe. But the sun will eventually, in many billions of years, cool down, decreasing the energy required to cause weather and erosion. But before that happens, the sun will also increase in size so much that it will simply engulf the earth in its flames. But don't worry about that, because before that occurs, the Earth's interior will cool down. When the moment comes, also billions of years in the future, the crust will become thicker, the mantle will become thinner, and convection currents will slow down. They won't be powerful enough to continue to move the tectonic plates. And then, plate tectonics will stop and will never start up again. Meanwhile, rain, ice, and wind will continue to erode the landscape, which will become flatter and flatter. All settlements will be carried back out to the oceans. And there could come a day in which all of the relief, all of the mountains, all of the land above the sea will be completely disappeared. The planet would become a perfect sphere covered entirely by water. The land masses will vanish under the seas and all of its inhabitants will vanish. Well, not all of them. Oh, who lives in a pineapple under the sea? Spongebob Absorbent and yellow and porous is he? Anyway, we shouldn't really worry about it. It'll only happen after billions of years. In fact, it's much more likely that we will have destroyed ourselves before the solar system has a chance to destroy us. That's all for today. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe because you know it helps the channel greatly. If you want to watch more interesting videos, check out our channel on other topics like these. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time.